Okay, welcome to the theory session. I'm uh, Ryo, and Shu and I uh, is going to chair this session. We will have six talks in this session. The first talk is bit security as computational cost for winning games with high probability by Shun Watanabe and uh, Kenji Asnaga. Kenji is going to speak. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you for introduction. My name is Kenji Asnaga. This talk is about the new framework for bit security. This is a joint work with of Shun Watanabe. A bit security is a, a well-established measure of quantifying the security level of cryptographic primitives. And we say a primitive P has K bit of, of security if every adversary needs to do this K operation to attack primitive P. So the question is how can we define bit security? Let's consider the case of the one-way function. F is, a one -way fun uh, F is a function, and suppose that there is some adversary with computational cost T such that the probability the adversary A breaks the one-wayness of F with probability epsilon. Then we can say that bit security is at the most log base two of T over epsilon. The reason is that if we, we invoke a in total n times, then the probability that some adversary A breaks one awareness of F will be amplified to epsilon n. So it is sufficient to choose n is equal to one over epsilon. So the total cost of order n times t is equal to order t over epsilon. So the bit, bit security should be defined as the minimum value of log two of t over epsilon. And this way of evaluating the bit security can be extended to other such type primitives and assumptions. So the questions we want to ask in this work is how to define bit security of decision type primitives and assumptions. And in decision type in decision games, we designed the game such that the winning probability of the adversary is close to one half. So we usually use this value as the advantage of the adversary. So the question is, is this advantage is the right measure for evaluating bit security? And in this work, we introduced a new framework for defining bit security. And we apply the same operational meaning for such and decision games. The interpretation is that the game has capital security if every adversary needs cost of to scale for winning the game with high probability. And as the answer to the second question in the previous slide, we show that the learning advantage is the right measure for evaluating the security of decision games. The reason is that in our framework, the adversary plays the binary hypothesis testing. And we show several natural reductions of bit security between security games. As the characterization of our bit security, we show that for any decision game, is the bit security is uh, characterized as this. This is a learning advantage of the adversary, uh, which is defined as learning divergence of order one half between two distributions regarding the adversary. And as a comparison, we compare the linear advantage and the conventional advantage. Suppose that the adversary A has, the conventional advantage of the adversary A is equal to epsilon. Then we show that linear advantage is lower bounded by epsilon squared and upper bounded by squared. Uh, epsilon, I'm sorry, lower bounded by epsilon squared and upper bounded by epsilon. So there is a gap between learning advantage and the conventional advantage. Uh, we show several natural bit security reduction. One notice is that about the gold like theorem, 
we show that capable to secure one function implies capable to secure how to completely cut for some district class of adversaries. So to prove the general case remains an interesting open question. So that's all. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any questions right now. So should does anybody else have any questions right now? I don't see any on Zoom or the Asia Group portal. Okay, we can take uh, questions after all talks. So if you uh, anyone doesn't have a question, then we move to the second talk. Oh, so Can I ask like one naive question then? Um, so what did you mean by balanced uh, adversaries? Yes, in this sense, we want to show that capital secure while function implies capital secure how to compare the for any adversary, but we prove this theorem only for the balanced adversary. So Kbit to Kbit is, is tight in this sense. Uh, right, uh, so what does balanced mean? Like, is it really restricting or what's the, what kind of like an adversary should we imagine this to be? Balanced means uh, the adversary are put uh, zero and one string with probability at least a constant probability. Okay, so do you think it's like a caveat of the proof technique or is it like something fundamental? Because it sounds a bit artificial. Or I might be wrong, but uh, I think it is, it is too restrictive. So we need to, you want to prove the for general cases. Okay. Um, all right. So there's one question from Julian. Uh, how is tightness defined with respect to this definition? Uh, yes, tightness means that kept secure one function plus kept secure k to k is tight. Uh, Julian, does that answer your question? No, no, it doesn't. Actually, my question was about, um, so, so there are different ways of defining tightness. Uh, for example, uh, you can define it using the advantage or the running time, like considering them separately. But uh, there's also, you know, the, the possibility of, of considering the fraction of the running time and the success probability. So how would you define tightness here? So if the if the, the fraction of uh, running time and success probability is equal for for both games, or yeah, in this game we see the two to k the exponent k, we only see the exponent k, the, the one value, which is related to epsilon and t in our framework. So you say that a reduction is tight if the if the, the quotient of the running time and the success probability is the same for for both solvers of the original game and the the game you you end up with or uh... yes if the time and the advantage is equal it is tight okay so it doesn't it doesn't change anything how you refine yeah refine if if we lose some advantage we get a lose reduction okay. Good. All right, I don't see any more questions right now, so uh, maybe we can come back if some somebody else has some questions. We can go to the next talk. All right, then let's move to the second talk. Uh, the second talk is uh, giving an adversary guarantees for how to model designated verifier signature in composable framework by uh, Guilherme Lito, Christopher Portman, Uri Maura, and uh, Guilherme uh, is going to speak. Oh, you are mute, muted. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, okay, yes. Hi, I'm Germ and I'm going um, 
to present you uh, our paper on giving an adversary guarantees or how to model designated verifier signatures in a composable framework. This is joint work with Willie Maher and Christopher Portman. So to start, let's have a look at the composable notion capturing authenticity. So this comprises a real world and ideal world. And we are going to assume a setting where we have five parties, Alice, Pop1, 2, and 3, and Eve. We have to assume the resources, the key generation authority, and the need secure channel. The key generation authority just generates Alice's keeper and sends the public key of Alice to everyone. And essentially, Alice, being honest, whenever Alice inputs something, uh, she writes something into her uh, sound converter. And essentially, this converter just takes uh, Alice's secret key, takes her message, and just generates a signature for this message and writes the message signature paired to this insecure channel. Each of these blobs here is also honest, so they also run some converter, which allows them to read from this insecure channel. So essentially, um, well, this converter will read from, from this channel a message signature pair will verify if the message signature pair is valid. And if it is, then it will output the message to one of these blocks. Finally, there is Eve, who only gets access to this public key of Alice. Now let's consider what if uh, here Bob3 is dishonest. So in this case, if Bob3 is dishonest, it simply does not run a converter. OK? So about the ideal world, essentially, we have uh, an authenticated channel to which Alice can write, and from which Bob1 and Bob2 can read. And then because if and both are dishonest, they interact with some simulator, which, well, since we only want to capture authenticity, can only read from this authentic authenticated channel. OK, so these kind of notions are normally composable security notions just say what uh, dishonest parties cannot achieve. For example, here, Bob3 and if cannot write into this authenticated channel. However, some security notions actually re rely on giving guarantees to dishonest parties. For example, let's have a look at MDVS signatures or multi designated verifier signatures. So, for this type of signatures, Alice can now designate uh, a bunch of receivers and designate Bob1, Bob2, and Bob3 as the recipients of her messages. And then uh, authenticity is given exclusively to these Bobs. So, only each of these blobs can actually learn that Alice is sending a message. This is called off the record. In particular, if cannot tell if Alice is sending a message, even if any subset or like any one of these blobs of these designated receivers is dishonest. Well, how is this possible? Essentially, uh, any dishonest party can pretend that Alice is sending some message. And if cannot tell them, the difference whether it's actually Ali sending a message or someone else is pretending that Ali is sending a message. And this must hold even if Eve knows all the secrets of any possibly dishonest receivers. Okay, so now let's just have a look at a naive attempt to capture uh, the, the authenticity in the off-the-record properties of MDVS. So what would what what one would have is something like well. Let's consider the previous uh, real world from before. And now every, everyone has actually a key pair. So every Bob also has a key pair. So here Alice receives everyone's key, uh, public key and each of these Bobs also receives everyone's public key. Also, of course, he also gets the public key of everyone. And now each party also gets its own secret key. What if now Bob3 is dishonest? Well, now, not only does not run a converter, but its secret key will also leak to Eve. So here it's just leaking to Eve. Okay, what about the ideal world? Well, we want to capture authenticity. Also off the record, but we want to capture authenticity. So essentially we, we capture this by, by a authenticated channel, to which Alice can write and from which Bob1 and Bob2 can read. Here, the authenticity guarantee says that if Bob1 or Bob2 read, then it was Alice writing. So in particular, this means that this Bob3 cannot be allowed to write into this authenticated channel. But, but this is actually a problem because any inforgeable signature scheme, like any normal signature scheme actually satisfies this composable notion. So this ideal world is actually capturing only authenticity and cannot capture off the record. To capture off the record, 
Eve would not be able to tell if Alice sent a message or if he is dishonest for three, he's pretending that Alice is sending a message. Okay. So the problem is how can we guarantee that these dishonest parties, that dishonest folks can write? Or more generally, how can we give uh, dishonest parties capability? How can we guarantee that they have some capability? And our approach to this is by using the notion of specifications introduced by Maurer and Brenner. Essentially, one specification capture what dishonest parties cannot do, as, as usual, so authenticity, if honest Bob reads a message and knowledge wrote it, and the other specification uh, states what dishonest parties can do. So in this case, dishonest parties can write to. And then the ideal world is an intersection of these specifications. Okay, so our contributions are, we show how to give guarantees to dishonest parties in a compostable framework in constructive cryptography. And in particular, we give the first composable notions capturing the security of multi-designated verifier signature schemes. Finally, we give a comparison against existing security notions capturing the security of MDVS. And we find that actually only recently, the notions introduced by Dunbar et al actually captured the security of MDVS. Still, these notions are strictly stronger than our composable notions. Okay, thank you for your attention. This is all, and thanks. Thank you. Um, right now, we don't have any questions on the Zoom chat or the Asia Group portal. Um, does anybody have any online questions right now that they want to ask? I actually have one question that I was uh, interested in. So uh, when you mentioned that there's like several several uh, strengths of DBS, like in the last slide, uh, does it constitute like in a practical attack or I, I'm not, I don't know much about DBS. So like it's, is the security property like not well formed right now or how should we understand this? Of which one? Sorry, I did not get uh, For the multi, I would assume oh. that there's a lot of definitions for MDVS yes, that's yes. been established. And, uh... Yes, so there are many definitions. Um, there is one which is sufficient. So there is the one introduced by Dunbard is actually sufficient to capture the security of MDVS, to capture the, the well, our composable notions. And our composable notions just give like a natural application. So I would say there are currently like uh, sufficient, sufficiently strong security notions. Uh, but previous ones actually did, were not sufficiently strong. Mm -hmm. Can you like explain at a very high level, like why it won't be, you know, uh, sufficient in practice, like those like previous definitions, or is that a bit difficult to explain? Um, there are many different reasons for which they are not sufficient. I can give you one reason. Uh, for example, um, for the case of multi-designated verifier signatures, um, there can be, well, multiple <laughs> designated verifiers. So uh, one thing is any subset of these verifiers might be dishonest. And most previous notions, well, only Dunbar actually introduced something called um, any subset of the record. That essentially what this guarantees is that any subset of the dishonest verifiers can pretend that Alice is sending something. Or it, in his terms, it would be, it would read as, any subset of the dishonest verifiers can simulate, uh, can forge uh, signatures that look like Alice's. And yeah, this is just an example. Okay, great. Um, any other questions? Uh, I don't see any, so maybe we can come back later then. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, the next talk is uh, how to build a top function from an encryption scheme by Sanjam Garg, Muhammad Hajabadi, Julio Marabota, Rafael Osofsky. Muhammad is going to speak. All right, thank you. <clears throat> so let me start by um, reviewing the notion of trapdoor functions. Um, trapdoor functions are a family of uh, injective functions where each function in the family can be computed in the forward direction using an index key and can also be efficiently inverted 
using a corresponding trapdoor key. And we have one witness which says um, a randomly chosen function from the family should be one way uh, in the absence of a trapdoor key. Um, in our work, we are interested in realizing notions of trapdoor functions in advanced settings, such as in uh, attribute-based encryption, predicate encryption, and identity-based encryption. Why do we care? Well, because um, these um, TDF notions enable applications which are not known uh, from their randomized variants. Um, in particular, uh, we know how to build um, designated verifier NISIC for all MP from single key attribute-based TDFs, but we don't know how to do this from randomized AVEs or from trapdoor functions alone. Also, single key security is a fairly weak notion uh, for ABEs because in the randomized setting, it is equivalent to um, a CPA secure public encryption. So if it turns out that uh, trapdoor functions imply single key attribute-based TDFs, like uh, in, in the randomized setting, then uh, we can build designated verifier music for all MP from trapdoor functions, which would generalize a recent result by Hohenberger, Coppola, and Waters. Also, these TDF notions allow us to build uh, deterministic public encryption schemes in the attribute-based setting. Our results in a nutshell uh, are as follows. We show how to build trapdoor functions uh, in advanced settings from their randomized encryption counterparts by also using hinting PRGs, where, where we require that uh, the randomized encryption schemes to have pseudo-random ciphertexts. The TDFs that we built, however, only provide selective security in the choice of the attributes. As our second result, so we, we introduce and build a notion that we call trapdoor garbling, which is a garble circuit where if the output of the circuit is a zero, we will have simulation security in the standard sense for garble circuits. And if the output of the circuit is one, then a garbled, cir uh, a garbled circuit evaluator will not only learn the output, but will also learn all the randomness R that went into the creation of the garble circuit and uh, the garble labels. We show how to build a trapdoor garbling from DDH or LWE and how to use this notion to build adaptively secure single key attribute based uh, TDFs. There's also some prior work. Uh, the work of Kitagawa, Matsuda, and Tanaka shows how to build trapdoor functions in the standard setting um, from a combination of uh, CPA secure public encryption with uh, pseudorandom ciphertexts and KDM secure private key encryption schemes. Even though they didn't explicitly prove it, but it, but it seems that uh, their results should generalize uh, to the ABE setting. This would be very similar to our first results, but the new thing in our work is the notion of trapdoor garbling, which we believe might have further um, applications. So let me conclude. Uh, the most interesting open problem here would be to build uh, single key attribute-based trapdoor functions from trapdoor functions. And if this question turns out to be difficult, one can look at whether there exists some kind of separations between these two notions or whether we can possibly build weaker notions such as uh, designated verifier NISIC from trapdoor functions. And uh, that's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you. So there's one question on Zoom. I'll read it out. And uh, McCoy, sorry if I'm mispronouncing. Uh, McCoy is asking, is the DBNISC a uh, smooth projective hash function in this case? Uh, 
I'm not sure what that question what that question means. Can you elaborate what you mean by? Oh that? yes, uh, earlier on you were talking about building a uh, designated verifier and ICKs, and I was curious if in that situation they were specifically in an instantiation of a smooth projective hash function. Right. So, uh, so the thing is, um, uh, so are you asking whether these notions? are equivalent? Uh, yes. Yeah. And I'm not sure that all these notions are equivalent. Because um, when we think about uh, projective hash functions in the sense of um, shoop, then we require two modes. They should be indistinguishable. And uh, we are kind of hoping that uh, DVNESC uh, can be built from generic assumptions like uh, trapdoor functions. And so it's, it's kind of hard uh, to imagine how we can build such hash functions from generic primitives such as uh, trapdoor functions. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Um, if not, uh, I guess we could move on to the next speaker and come back later. Okay. Uh, next talk is Beyond Software Watermarking Trait Addressing for Pseudo Random Functions by Richard Goya, Sam Kim, Brent Waters, David Wu. Richard is going to speak. You can see the slides, right, Rio? Yes. Perfect. OK. Thanks a lot for the introduction. And today, I'll tell you how to trace pseudorandom functions that helps us going beyond the perceived boundaries of software watermarking. So as probably most of us have already seen, or at least in this audience, uh, physical watermarks, they're prevalent everywhere. What is software watermarking? Software watermarking is just like uh, is a, is a software analog of physical watermarking, where the point is, you have a computer program and you want to embed uh, information inside those computer programs such that anybody who tries to remove that particular watermark or this mark of crypto should also destroy the functionality of the program. Now, watermarking is, uh, has had a tremendous amount of applications since its uh, development. And uh, the abstractly, watermarking can be defined via two algorithms. The marking and the extraction algorithm, where the watermarking algorithm takes us into a circuit or a program description and the watermark value M, and it gives you a watermarked version of the particular circuit or program. And we also have an extraction algorithm that takes input a particular circuit, which could be watermarked, and tries to extract that watermark from that circuit, as long as that circuit was not uh, destroyed by uh, the adversary. Now, Watermarking has uh, two important guarantees that it provides. First is called the functionality preserving, which says if you start with a computer program and you try to watermark it by any particular uh, uh, message M, then in that case, the watermark program should also be functionally similar or functionally identical to the initial program. It should preserve the functionality because if it doesn't func uh, preserve the functionality, then it's not very useful in order to watermark because you're destroying the functionality. But the more interesting property for watermarking is called the unremovability guarantee, which is the security property here, which basically says if an adversary, given a watermark program, tries to remove this particular watermark, should also destroy the functionality of the program. That means the adversary should not be able to compute a, 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 a circuit which does not have the watermark, but is very similar to the in initial program, at least functionally similar. Software watermarking though it's tremendous, it can, as you can see, it can only be achieved for functions that are not learnable because if a function was learnable, in that case, the adversary will learn the function, simply create a, create a totally new function uh, for that particular value. So in order to do that, uh, watermarking has been widely studied for cryptographic programs because they are believed to be widely unlearnable. And a bunch of work has followed in trying to study the notion of watermarking pseudo-random functions, which is one of the most fundamental objects in cryptography. So in watermarking PRS, you start with the PRF key that is embedded inside a program that simply evaluates the pseudonym function and try to watermark it and try to embed a particular information in it so that it, uh, it prevents unauthorized sharing of that pseudonym key. Now let us look a little more closely at the watermarking security property again. So if you recall, the unremovability security property says 
that the circuit must be the watermark circuit should be very similar to the circuit that the adversary generated. So suppose I give you a watermark circuit for this PR function. And now as an adversary, I create a following program. My program is now only going to output the first n by four bits of this particular PRF and nothing more. Now it turns out this particular program is not a valid program as per the unremovability guarantees that we have currently. Because the current unremovability guarantees for watermarking say that the circuit that the adversary creates and the circuit that you started with, they must be identical, functionally identical on almost all inputs. Okay? We are not identical at all. We are only identical in the first n by four bits, but not at all. So it seems like uh, this particular program is not, uh, you can't prevent security against these particular attackers. There's no guarantees that the mark is preserved or not when she sort of cre created an attack. And it turns out a lot of, or maybe all the existing watermarking instructions are unable to recover the watermark from this type of program if you sort of uh, carry out this type of attack. At this point, you might be wondering, okay, maybe these attacks cannot be preventing uh, using watermarking, but are they actually meaningful? Can these attacks happen in practice? To that end, let me explain a very simple example to you of a simple application of watermarking PRF. Suppose a watermarkable PRF is used to protect unauthorized distribution of decryption keys because a PRF key could be used as a decryption key. Then the point is that the adversary's program, if it is only good enough to break the application of uh, decryption, that uh, can be done using this partial information about the PRF key, but it might not preserve watermarking. For example, in this particular case, if we use the PRF key to encrypt the image, and I use this particular program on the left side, which only outputs the first, the leading n by four bits, then I can actually use this particular program to partially decrypt the underlying message. And that will give me a lot of information about the underlying message. So basically the point here is that for building blocks like PRFs, we don't necessarily need to recover the output precisely to break the functionality of PRFs. And the larger point here is that typically in cryptography, the adversary's goals and honest parties' goals are separate. For honest parties, we want that correctness should always hold. You should be always be able to recover everything about the ciphertext text in, uh, from the ciphertext text about a message if you're talking about encryption. But for security require, you should not be able to learn anything from the ciphertext, text, nothing. And that's a really large gap. Everything versus nothing. Now, to that end, in watermarking cryptographic programs, typically when we have studied them so far, we have studied exact functionality preserving for watermarking schemes. But it does not seem to be the right security notion if you want to get all possible applications. And basically what happens is that the adversary's program might break the primitive, but the watermark just, uh, it might, it, it should happen, the watermark should still be preserved whenever you break the primitive. It should not be the case that you only uh, uh, preserve the watermark when you're sort of almost similar to the initial program. And to that end, we introduced the concept of traceable pseudonymous functions in this work. And traceable pseudonymous functions are aimed to fill this gap with the idea is that now the marking security or the unremovable security for the, uh, uh, for the scheme is going to say, if an adversary creates a program C, that can distinguish the PRF from random values, can actually carry out a distinguishing attack, then watermark can uh, be extracted. Then the watermark should be preserved. So rather than saying that the circuit C that the adversary creates is functionally almost similar to the initial program, if it can be used to just perform a distinguishing attack, then you should be able to extract watermark. So it's a strengthening and trying to capture that even the previous attack I showed to you in which we had only N by four of the bits, that uh, particular attackers can also be traced or can also be extracted. And the analog, uh, basically the traceable pseudonymous functions are an analog of the traitor tracing systems, which are encryption systems, which have these tracing guarantees, which basically say, if you have a decoder that can decrypt ciphertext, then I can, from that decoder, extract the information about the user secret keys. And we basically are using the analog of uh, traitor tracing for pseudonymous functions as well, a symmetric key object. Now, just summarizing, in this work, we propose the concept of traceable pseudonymous functions as a means to uh, close this gap and possibly go for better definitions for watermarking that can provide uh, security from a wider uh, a variety of attacks. And we provide new results where we give a single key traceable uh, PRF in the secret key setting with security under the learning with that assumption. And we also show if you assume indistinguishably obfuscation, then you can get all uh, the best properties, fully collision resistant, public tracing and everything. Now, in the interest of time, I won't tell you how to actually build it, but just let me quickly mention that the higher level picture of building traceable PRFs is similar to the story that has been carried for over, 
I would say a decade and a half for creative tracing, where we started with uh, something called private linear broadcast encryption, which was a restricted notion of encryption, and that gave us data tracing. Here, we rely on something that we call private linear constraint PRFs. That's a relaxation of constraint PRFs, and we show how to use that to perform traceability in PRFs. So just trying to summarize again, uh, in this work, we propose a new unremovability guarantee for pseudorandom functions, which says, as long as a program can distinguish PRF outputs, then it should be preserve the watermarking in certain senses. We should be able to extract it. And more generally, what we're trying to claim is that in cryptography, in trying to watermark cryptographic functions, we should not always tie functionality preserving to input output preservation. Functionality preserving for cryptographic functions when you have to extract something should be tied together to the security property or uh, to the security of the underlying system. And with that, I would like to conclude and thanks for listening. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? So we don't currently have any on Zoom or the Asia Crypt portal site. Um, if not, I had one question, or it might be two. Uh, so this was a really interesting talk, and uh, I was. In, um, what I wanted to ask is: so usually, I, I don't know much about watermarking, but usually. Uh, when I hear about watermarking, it's mainly about PRFs, and it's not because you know we can use PRFs to construct signatures, decryption keys. Is that like the main target, or are there other primitives that we want to watermark which we can't do from PRFs right now? So uh, the question, so the one of the reasons, and I guess even Rio would be a good person to also answer that. So Rio, feel free to chip in uh, if you feel my answer is insufficient. But the main reason why PRFs has been started so far for watermarking is that watermarking is it's a, it's an advanced property to have. It's not easy to prove uh, uh, watermarking security for cryptographic functions. So the research started with the simplest possible object, which was pseudorandom function, because it's the most fundamental object in cryptography. And absolutely, the question is that, can we try to watermark more interesting uh, types of functionalities? And initially it was believed that maybe if you go higher, it must, it must get harder than pseudorandom functions. Although uh, it's not unclear right now because for some advanced functions, it's easier to watermark uh, those particular functions like public key functions rather than secret key functions. But initially when, we, uh, when the research started, it was mostly focused on PRFs from the perspective trying to get feasible results where we had no feasible results so far. And in the last, I would say, five years, we've seen a lot of feasible results for watermarking PRFs. And that has opened what are the cryptographic functions we can watermark. So the jury is still out there that what is the maximum class of function that we can watermark. It typically depends, as you said, it depends upon the applications. We can, you can also always try to ask questions about watermarking different, different things, but there must be an application in mind that you should sort of uh, focus in on and then maybe look at watermarking that particular functionality. I'm not sure if that completely answers the question or not. It does, thank you, yeah. So I guess like if we find like another primitive that we want to watermark, then at that point, there's going to be a question like, can we make that traceable in this setting that you explained? Absolutely, 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 okay. absolutely, absolutely. Yes, yes. Great, um, are there any other questions? Uh, if not, I guess we can move on to the next talk. Okay. Uh, the next talk is uh, batching based over radius transfers by Ian McCoy, Mike Rosek, Lawrence Roy. Uh, Ian is going to speak. Yeah, maybe you're muted. Oh, OK. Uh, thank you. Um, let's get right to it then. So uh, oblivious transfers, what are they? So in a very general sense, oblivious transfer is a protocol um, between two parties, where one party receives two messages, another party inputs a bit, and receives one of those messages corresponding to that bit. Specifically, when we're looking at the security properties of these protocols, and in specifically uh, uniform oblivious transfer, we have that the receiver, the one inputting the bit, will learn nothing about the message that they didn't receive. So if they input bit zero, they receive message zero and learn nothing about message one. The sender, on the other hand, the one that receives both messages, is going to learn nothing about the receiver's choice bit. 
And where do we see uh, oblivious transfer or OT for short in the wild? Uh, we see it in garbled circuits, where in some constructions, um, garbled circuits require a, an oblivious transfer for each AND gate in the circuit. And we also see oblivious transfer come up in private set intersection. In these applications, we will see that oblivious transfer uh, is needed millions of times, necessarily requiring uh, asymmetric operations. And so these millions of OTs will need to be um, done with asymmetric operations, which are extremely expensive, millions of times. So how do we get around this? To get around this, we want to have some sort of protocol where we take in some small number of OTs, which we have to do with expensive asymmetric operations. And then we want to transform them into a polynomial size, in the previous cases, millions of actual realized OTs. But we don't want to use these expensive operations. We want to use some cheap symmetric operations. And we have a way to do that. It's what we call um, oblivious transfer extension, or OT extension. And in this situation, we were able to do that. We were able to take a small number of OTs, usually 128 or the um, security parameter, and extend them into millions of actual realized OTs. But since we have to make those base OTs at some point in time using these asymmetric operations, we're going to want to look at how to optimize these uh, oblivious transfers that we actually have to do. Um, and in this situation, uh, we're going to treat them as in a single cohesive unit in a batch and refer to this as the batch setting. As it turns out, the natural way of batching a lot of oblivious transfer protocols that were out there in the wild lacked a principal treatment and actually had security flaws that were in um, real world libraries. So let's look at a uh, actual oblivious transfer protocol. So this is a protocol from our previous paper from CCS 2020. And how it works is we start off by the sender sending a normal key agreement message over to the receiver. The receiver samples their private key and they, sam uh, and they choose a choice bit, either zero or one. Then they wrap their um, protocol message uh, in this case, their key grant message by encrypting it with an ideal cipher. And as their key, they're going to use their choice bit. And so they send, send, they send that over to the sender. Then at the end, the sender is going to decrypt the wrapped key grant message that they got under both possible choice bits. Now, what this is going to do is it's going to give them two possible key agreement message outputs. Then they're going to treat both of those as separate key agreement messages and derive the uh, shared key for each of those messages. The receiver, on the other hand, is just going to do their normal key agreement output. Now, as it turns out, the only key agreement message that the receiver could have possibly learned in this case is the one corresponding to their choice bit. As let's say that the receiver had choice bit one, then decrypting this wrapped key group message under a key of one will give the actual receiver's uh, key group message back to the sender. And then they'll arrive at the same shared key. The other output, the one that's decrypted under a key of zero, the uh, receiver's not chosen choice bit, the receiver can't possibly know the uh, secret to that key. And so they won't be able to derive the same key group message. So, what if we want to run these 128 base OTs that we need for OT extension? We'd have to run them in series. Uh, we're going to send our key agreement message over, and we're going to resend a wrapped key agreement message back. And this is going to happen 128 times. Well, in the real world, we often reuse key agreement messages. Like you have a public key that you use for multiple uh, key agreement uh, outputs. Then what if we did the same thing here for uh, batching oblivious transfers. Well, it looks something like this, where we just send one key agreement message over from the sender, and then the receiver is going to sample their uh, is going to sample their keys, uh, one for each of the individual instances of the OT protocol in a batch. But they're going to use the first message that the sender sent for every single one of those when deriving their shared key. Well, as it turns out, there's actually an attack on this protocol. 
first thing we're going to do is we're going to carry through the protocol as normal. The sender is going to send their key agreement message over to the receiver. Then, as we did earlier in the actual in the original protocol, the receiver is going to generate their uh, their corresponding uh, message in the protocol just by wrapping their key agreement message under one of the two possible choice bits. In this case, we're just going to choose zero. Then, in the actual protocol, without without this optimization, we would choose a different key agreement message for each message that we send over to the, uh, to the sender. But in this situation, we're attacking the protocol, we're going to repeat the same message for every single instance of the protocol instead of, send, instead of sampling a new secret for every message. What this ends up doing is it ends up making it so that for every instance inside of a batch of OTs, the sender is going to get the same message for each one. So this doesn't mean that you're going to get the same message for choice bit of zero and choice bit of one, but rather it means that the first OT instance is going to have message one, message two. The second OT instance is going to have the same message one, message two. And this is going to iterate through every single one of the instances within an OT, uh, within an OT batch. And this is something that can't um, can't happen in the situation where we're not using this, what we call naive form of optimization. And as it turns out, it affects OT extension protocols in a devastating way. Specifically, when looking at the OOS OT extension, it allows us to, or allows the adversary to extract all of the receiver's choice bits in the protocol. However, this is something specific to OOS as it relies on the code words when we're uh, generating the error correcting, when we're using error correcting codes for generating the messages inside of an OT extension protocol. We need the code word on zero and the code word on one to not be bitwise complements. But this is a very specific attack on a very specific protocol. And there may be more complex correlations that can be used to attack other OT extension protocols, such as KOS. Well, how do we fix this problem? Well, the problem was, is that we were able to have correlations between each of the protocol, each of the single protocols within a batch. And so we need to separate each of these OT instances. There's an actual easy way of doing this. Where in the original protocol, we just sent a key agreement message over and they derived a key agreement message from their output untagged. We're now going to tag these key agreement messages. So an easy way of doing this is by, instead of using just normal Diffie-Hellman key agreement, to use a hashed Diffie-Hellman key agreement, where as one of the inputs to the final hash, we're going to have a tag. And in this specific instance, that tag is just going to be which of the OT instances we're looking at. So the first time, the first OT instance is going to have a tag of one, and the nth OT instance is going to just have a tag of n. Then we implemented our protocol with, um, with this new form of batching. And we found that it gave us a market increase in both the wireless area network and local area network settings. And when we were testing this, we were testing it over the normal um, way that we'd see it being used, for instance, 128 base OTs. We also implemented a optimization to these style of protocols to get a, another market increase in performance. I wasn't able to go over uh, some of the key points from our full paper during this time, but just as a teaser, we expanded some of the known OT constructions from our previous paper, also including some optimizations, as well as a generalization of Mosny and Rindell's endemic OT protocol to the style of uh, OT, as well as providing our optimizations to it. And some open problems that we noticed. We're curious if other similar problems arise in other OT extensions, as a lot of these proofs don't think about correlations. 
We're also interested in seeing if there's any post-quantum key agreements that meet the properties required for a protocol. Specifically, this is built in a generic way that's built for any uh, key agreement, but we specifically instantiated it with uh, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. And we uh, showed some new instances of a uh, primitive, which we call program for once public functions, uh, which are very useful for building these style of protocols. And we're curious what else they could be used in other than uh, Blivy's transfer. And in our previous paper, we showed that they're used in um, PAIC, uh, password authentic key exchange, and oblivious to random function instantiation. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, we currently do not have any questions on Zoom or Azure Group Portal. Are there any online questions that people want to ask right now? I think uh, we are running out of time. So if you have okay. any question, please uh, write on the uh, uh, Zurich chat to, and uh, uh, receive the answers on, offline. OK, uh, the last talk of this session is algebraic adversaries in the universal composability framework by Michel Abla, Manuel Barbosa, Jonathan Katz, Julian Ross, Jayushu, and Julian is going to speak. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Great. Okay, so in this work, we consider two very well known models from the literature. And the first one is called the Universal Composability Framework, it was introduced by Canetti in 2001. And it's essentially a framework for proving uh, security properties of MPC protocols. And the idea is that um, we define the goal of an MPC protocol with uh, respect to some ideal functionality. And then we show that uh, for any real world adversary, uh, there exists an ideal adversary. Let's call that ideal adversary um, S, a simulator, such that for all environments, um, excuse me, for all environments, uh, it is impossible to distinguish whether or not it's uh, interacting with, um, with the ideal functionality or protocol realizing that ideal functionality. And uh, if we can provide such a simulator, then we would say that this protocol satisfies the UC security definition. So this model is very useful because it provides a composition uh, theorem, which essentially means that you can take any um, protocol that has been proven secure with respect to this definition uh, and compose it in any uh, shape, type, or form with another protocol that also satisfies this security definition. So it does not matter how you interleave them, whether you use one protocol as a subroutine to another, um, like any way you compose them will, will remain secure by this composition theorem. So it's very, very useful as a security definition. Now, the second model that we consider here is the algebraic group model, which was introduced by Fuchsbauer, Kiels, and myself in uh, 2018. And um, this model is essentially a, a model uh, of, let's say, um, idealized computation that stands in between the uh, standard model and the generic group model. So here, adversaries are idealized in the following sense, in that they are restricted as to how they compute their output. Um, so if an adversary A gets a bunch of group elements, which I've denoted here as x1 to xn, and it outputs a group element y in the group, then uh, it, it also has to output these algebraic coefficients lambda 1 to lambda n, which we call the algebraic representation, such that y can be expressed as this product of group elements to these algebraic coefficients. And so this essentially means that uh, the adversary is restricted to computing these elements in sort of a semi-honest way. But uh, in comparison to the generic group model, it actually sees the concrete representations of these group elements and um, it, uh, it can infer additional uh, information from those representations. However, uh, there is currently no way to combine these two models with each other. So it's not clear what it means to uh, look at an algebraic adversary in the universal composability framework. Uh, so all of the 
uh, proofs that we currently have in the AGM are basically uh, game-based and they don't carry over to this UC framework. And uh, that is exactly the uh, goal of our, of our work to start to formalize this uh, UC AGM framework, which sort of combines these two frameworks and allows to uh, essentially use the best of both worlds of these frameworks uh, to prove uh, theorems in the algebraic group model, which also satisfy some sort of composability notion. Okay, so again, I mean, what we, what we provide here essentially is an adaptation of this uh, UC composability uh, theorem, uh, which holds with respect to algebraic entities. So our version of the uh, UC composability theorem would be that uh, you know, protocol real uh, or UC AGM realizes a functionality F if for all algebraic real adversaries A, there exists an algebraic simulator S such that for all algebraic environments uh, epsilon, the views in these two worlds, the simulated one and the real world uh, are indistinguishable. And so now uh, this you know, sounds very intuitive, but it actually comes along with a, with a lot of issues. So first of all, you have to define what it means at the formal level to be algebraic in the UC framework. Um, it's actually a little subtle how to do that. Um, and then also, of course, we have to adapt this uh, composition theorem, which you which we're using in the in this uh, in this framework to prove things. And um, the, the composition theorem, of course, says the same thing, but as, as it was before. So if you if you realize something in the UC AGM, then you can arbitrarily compose it, uh, subject to this composition theorem, of course. But uh, here you get a lot of subtle issues because uh, group elements can come from the protocols that uh, you run on the outside of these of these subroutines, and they can pr be provided as um, uh, as part of the algebraic adversaries representation when you run these protocols that you previously realized as subroutines of larger order protocols, and that makes it very subtle to prove this composition theorem. And uh, if you're interested, then you can you can look how we do it in our work. Okay, so now some results that we show in this in this work. Um, actually some analyses of uh, very well-known protocols, for example, the uh, Chu Orlandi OT protocol. So this was proposed by Chu and Orlandi in 2015. And it's, it's very, very simple and fast, it's a very uh, conceptually nice protocol. And um, it was originally claimed to be UC secure, but it has a little bit of a complicated history, as you can see here. So in 2017, there was a uh, work of Gensch, aptly named uh, Too Simple to be UC Secure. Uh, and, and they essentially show that there's a problem with adaptive corruptions in the, in the original proof of Chu and Olandi. And um, then later it was actually uh, worked by Hauke and myself where we, where we patched these two, uh, these two flaws in, in CO's proof and showed adaptive corruption. But then later it was actually another bug found in this, in this CO protocol, uh, which stems from extraction, which we also heard about in the last talk. And uh, our observation basically is that uh, if you look at this protocol in the UC AGM framework, then uh, the extraction is very simple because you can basically extract from the adversary's first message. And uh, so we, we managed to prove this protocol secure in our UC AGM context. Um, okay, so another application that we show is an analysis of several password-based deauthentication protocols, such as SPAC 1 and 2 and uh, CPACE. And um, so here you can, you can sort of see a table of what is known. Um, so we have game-based proofs for, for several of them. Uh, we also have relaxed UC proofs for some of them. And, and we actually show that we can prove all of them uh, secure in the, in the UC AGM. And uh, yeah, good. That concludes my talk. Here is the link to our paper. Um, and if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Thanks. Thank you for the talk. So uh, we don't have any questions on Zoom or the Asia Group portal right now. Are there any online questions that somebody wants to ask? Can I ask one question? Uh, when you said that you were able to prove the, um, I forgot the name of this OT, like the really efficient one, secure in this UC Asia model. 
Um, you also mentioned that in the previous talk, there was like a subtle attack or like an error in the batch OT part. Like how do they relate to each other? Oh, no, I didn't mean that there was an error in the previous, in the, in the paper mm, okay. presented in the previous talk. Sorry, that was not what I was saying. I was saying that there was an error in, um, in previous versions of the security proof for the specific Chualandi protocol. Sorry if that... Uh... Oh, right, okay. Mm -hmm. So when you mentioned that you were able to uh, like prove their uh, OT in this UC, UC agent framework, like which protocol were you uh, talking? Is it, is it like a fix, fixed OT protocol or which scheme were you mentioning? Right. No, no. So, so okay. So I can. What, what I was saying in my 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 talk was that essentially there was a, there was an issue with extraction uh, in this OT protocol. So, so that's always something that you that you have to um, to prove when you're doing things in the UC framework, right? That you have to show that the uh, messages of the sender and the and the choice bits of the receiver can be extracted. So it's always uh, that the difficulty of these proofs and in the, in the previous version of uh, a proof of this paper, this extraction was not possible because uh, basically you do it using some random Oracle query and the adversary just doesn't have to make that query and then you cannot extract. But here, um, uh, the, the point is that uh, from the adversary's very first message in this protocol, uh, you sort of see what the adversary's choice bit is um, or if the adversary malforms this message, then you know that uh, it cannot distinguish uh, whether or not you give it like the correct message, because it can never recover it if it if it makes a, like a if it gives you a malformed message, and that way you can you can always faithfully carry out this simulation. So either you can you can really carry it out with respect to the choice bit of the receiver, or you can just carry it out in any way, and you know that the adversary will not be able to tell that you've you've just you you, you were not able to to extract it. Um, so that's the idea, and. Um, and, and we actually managed to prove the original CO protocol secure here. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. So we don't have any more questions and I think we're out of time. Rio? Yep. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you uh, for the great talks. Okay, this is uh, the end of uh, the theory session. Thank you for the all participants and talk, uh, speakers.